We've now heard from several perspectives about how we can work together to implement strategies that empower workers, transform institutions, and prepare students for the evolving future of work. So to close out this morning's event, I want to welcome back to the podium Mr. Balaji Ganapati, who's going to deliver the closing keynote. Good afternoon. So I'm literally what stands between you and lunch. So um, what I'm going to do is, of course, this has been a fascinating discussion throughout the day. Um, and what I want to do is to sum it up uh, by bringing together a few elements that you've heard throughout the day. But to do that, what I want to paint is the picture of what changes are we going to experience as industry, as society, uh, both in terms of work, the workplace, and the workers. Um, I come from a company called TCS. We are a $20 billion organization with uh, 420,000 people around the world, uh, with $100 billion market capitalization. Um, we have employees from uh, 151 nationalities and uh, about 150,000 women. So um, I, I what I wanted to share is from the perspective of some of the learnings that we have had as it relates to this topic, as you think about the future of work and what it takes for a country and for people and systems to prepare for the rapid changes that are happening uh, um, around us. First of all, the change is not coming, the change is already here. That's the first thing that we need to realize. This, when we talk about the future of work, it appears or uh, it can, it can um, color our thought as it is something that's going to happen in the future. The future is here, the change is already happening, and what we need to do needs to start right now. And we started the day with Jim uh, leading the call to action to say uh, responsible leadership, but responsible business leadership is, uh, is important for change to happen. And when I say um, the future of work is here and now, what I also mean is there are two forces that are really coming together that have never happened in human history. Um, the physical, the human, and the digital worlds are converging. So business and technology are converging. And what is powering that is these two, two trends. One is the proliferation of new digital technologies. Think of that. What we had uh, in terms of Moore, Moore's law is being questioned today because of uh, uh, the rapid proliferation of technology. But along with that trend, where new technologies like artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, robotics, um, AR, VR, all of those are coming in, um, the second trend is that the ability for organizations and society to absorb those technologies for economic prosperity, for economic growth, the barrier for entry has never been lower than it is today. So along with the proliferation of those technologies, the ability of society for businesses to adopt those technologies has also gone up like never before. So when you have that as the crossroads of innovation and opportunity, what does it really do for enterprises, for countries, and for society, and therefore uh, the changing nature of work? What it does is the context of what work means is changing. At TCS, we call this business 4R2, which is basically enterprises bringing in and harnessing the power of these di digital technologies to become more intelligent, agile, automated, and on the cloud. Why? Because they want to deliver a better experience for their customers or their customers and customers. Jim uh, spoke about this brilliantly around employee experience, but it also leads to guest experience. And uh, in every industry, this is what companies are experiencing. Now, when that happens, there are three elements that uh, come out in terms of what we need to deal with. One is the current workforce. And we've done, uh, over the last three years, I want to also point out, we've done uh, some research with the World Economic Forum on this very same issue, um, on a project called Closing the Skills Gap. 
And one of the things that we learned early on is the skills gap is not a monolith. It's not just skills. It is fundamental skills. It is demographic gaps. It is um, physical gaps in terms of where work and opportunities are versus where people are. So there's a lot of nuances to that, right? So if we have to frame the top three challenges that we have to encounter and overcome um, in addressing the future of work and the opportunities that, bring, uh, that it brings, the first and foremost thing is that the skills required in the current workforce that all of us employ here in America and around the world, that is rapidly changing. Two years ago when we did the survey with the World Economic Forum, it was 32%. Last year when we did this, 52% of skills of the current workforce is changing, which means that much as we talk about the adaptive nature of future workforce, the primary thing for us as companies, as individuals, as societies, is to also focus on the current workforce. How do we prepare 52% or more of our current workforce with new skills? The second thing that stood out is that 65% of students who are entering primary school today are going to be in jobs that have not been invented yet. They are going to invent those jobs. They are going to invent those careers. How do we enable an ecosystem of learning where we can move from rote learning uh, and make it more experiential, more contextual, more exciting, more engaging, so that they can become those innovators that the world needs. In the next 15 years, the World Bank says that there are 600, new, 600 million new jobs that can be created. Many of those will come from those young people, that young generation that is going to go through our primary, middle, secondary uh, school systems, and then the higher education both the two-year institutions, the four-year institution, the non-traditional models, we'll need all of that. But that's the second challenge to address. The third one is that with the proliferation of technologies and the pace at which it is adopted uh, by organizations, more than 50% of the disparate impact is going to be on women and minorities. We spoke a lot today about access, about equity, about the need to develop inclusiveness in organizations and in society. Well, let me tell you, we are up against a bigger challenge because with the adoption of new technologies, those who are going to be left behind or those who have the potential to be left behind are the ones who are already uh, facing these challenges, facing these divides. So if that is the frame, of looking at current workforce and the skills that are needed, looking at the future workforce and creating a learning model and learning ecosystem that can develop that future workforce. And the third being keeping in mind uh, that we bring everybody along on this journey. How do we approach that? And let me offer you a few thoughts uh, which you have heard from many speakers in panels today and also from our own perspective um, in this space. The first and foremost thing is that um, upskilling and reskilling your own employees. Somebody, I heard the previous panel talk about uh, skills and employees as cost. No, it is not. It is an investment. In fact, why it is an investment, why it is an asset for companies is because contextual knowledge lies within the existing workforce. I mean, uh, a few years earlier, I was talking to um, one of the leaders at AT&T, and they were going through a massive uh, um, w skills change within their workforce. And instead of letting people go and hiring new people with the skills that they needed, um, in the area of cybersecurity, they were able to repurpose a lot of their line workers. Why? Because if you stare at the screen and try to control security, you are separated from the ground realities of who is trying to hack, who is trying to force their way into your systems. And that contextual knowledge of how to apply the skills that you're learning in the context of your business is the most important asset if you are a leader in an organization. So in my organization, we look at, it the, look at this as um, 
there are only legacy technologies, no legacy people. People can, if you provide them the opportunity, they can learn, they can grow, they can change. So over the past four years, we have upskilled and reskilled more than 300,000 of our 420,000 workers to be able to harness the power of these same digital technologies, but to be able to do that in a way where they bring their context and their knowledge to create innovation for customers across the world. So it is possible, but it requires thoughtfulness in terms of understanding and personalizing the needs of each individual, right? You may currently be in a role, how do I provide you a pathway to an adjacent role? By identifying the skills that are required for that role. By providing you with information on how you can acquire those skills. And once you acquire those skills, give you a project, give you an opportunity to apply that and navigate that pathway. And the same example applies when you think about the workforce of the future. We spoke a lot today about community college, four-year institutions, even high school. And uh, I think uh, Mayor, Mayor uh, Ram Emanuel said this really well when he said, you earn what you learn, and it starts early. In fact, um, elementary school and middle school are the turning points for what a young person decides uh, that they want to do in their uh, in, in future in, as a career. So we had to start very early. But education, if you as a private sector, if you as an external person from the education system wants to work with them, you have to respect the fact that it is decentralized in nature, which means that national problems will have local solutions. You may have something to offer that the community and the educational institution can absorb, but you have to meet them where they are. Be able to contextualize what you know as industry trends, as new job opportunities, as skills of the future, and break it down to what a local school or a school board or a school district or a workforce development board is able to absorb. And having the patience, having the perseverance, having the ability to make those investments will pay you rich dividends. I can tell you from our experience, our program called GoIT, we started this 10 years ago to work with students, middle school and high school students across the country, to give them a chance to learn skills, technology skills, but not just coding and programming, design thinking, human-centered design, innovation that they can use to solve real-world problems, empathy, emotional intelligence, and today, if you look at the top 10 skills that the World Economic Forum or other reputed institutions around the world say, technical skills does not feature in the top five. It is complex problem solving skills, creative thinking, emotional intelligence. Those non-cognitive skills. And if you learn those skills as a young person in the context of how you can apply that in the world of work, by applying that to a real problem, that your community faces, like a group of students in Wisconsin in Franklin Middle School did with our program. They learned computational thinking in the context of history and science and math, and then they looked at their community and saw a GM plant that was closed many years ago. And they reimagined that plant. They drew up a proposal to say how we can repurpose this plant to be a vibrant place where the community can get together and really work together. And they are pitching this idea to the township. Yes, young people have the answers to problems that the community faces, we, but we have to contextualize what they need to learn and bring it to them at that level. The final thing I want to mention is around uh, the need to focus on women and minorities and especially the under-resourced uh, groups in society. Mayor Emanuel so wonderfully well explained the success of Chicago as a city and how it has become a hub for companies to relocate and want to come back and work in that community. The challenge ahead of us is that it's not just the Chicago's and the Detroit's that need that kind of a renaissance. It is the smaller, the less urban, middle America, 
and places where these resources and funding will never reach. We need to be able to step up as leaders and say, what can we do, either as private institutions or as public-private partnerships, to go where the need is the most, not where it is most opportunistic for us because the pipeline makes itself very visible and we have to make just the last mile investments. That is when we transcend this discussion from one where it is a pipeline to one where it is pathways. So every person in a community has an opportunity to follow the pathway that will lead them to their own American dream. And I think that is possible thanks to the work of policy institutes like the MGM and UNLV. Because you are exploring these very same problems, but at the depth where you're asking the right questions. There is no silver bullet to any of this. But if I can offer you something that I'm seeing uh, and I'm learning the more I do this work in communities across the country, it is that one value, one strength that America has is resilience. It's always had that. But to harness that resilience, we need to be able to step up as leaders and prioritize the resources. Along with that resilience, we need a culture of caring, which a lot of countries around the world have. If you look at the systems and why they work in a Germany or a Switzerland or a India or other places around the world, because it is a population that cares, that cares about this problem enough to put their individual differences aside and say, we need to get this done now. And this with that culture of caring, along with the solutions that forums like these provide, that we can bring uh, solutions that are scalable, that are implementable. And I do believe that change will happen at a rapid pace. Whether it is the private sector or others who step up, the need exists and solutions are going to emerge. Um, but I thank each of you here in the room because you're participating in this important discussion to be part of the solution, not just part of the problem. Thank you.